Okay, Stephen Hall, happy birthday. Uh, it is the 9th of December, 2021. And on this day, Stephen Hall is 74 years old. Let's wish him to uh, catch up with the, uh, with the happy architects who are over 90 now and still uh, kicking, so to speak. Uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see why did I write when I made this presentation uh, last year, le fais et moi, le fais et nous. Actually, I mentioned this uh, in, a, in, a, in a booklet uh, that was published by his friend, Lebia Suds, who invited me to write about his works. And uh, at that time, uh, actually what I wrote, the title was The Center as a Paradigm of Wholeness. And in that short uh, writing, uh, I, 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 I refer to this, le fais et moi, le fais et nous, because I think any artist and any architect, uh, any, maybe even any monk is not, is, not, is not dedicating his life or her life only to himself or herself. It's about the others. But yes, you descend into yourself, but in order to discover what is outside of yourself. So I think even a monk or a yogi who retires, uh, you know, in the woods or who, wherever, in the solitude of his meditation, he reaches the others. And I think this is true of, uh, of the philosopher, of the thinker, of the poet, of the artist, and it is true also, I think, of, um, of Stephen Hall. This is the man, and I, I, I met him. Uh, we were even part of an exhibition uh, once. Um, I don't know if I have the poster of it here, but I do remember that it was a, an exhibition with portfolios in architecture. And there were seven or eight architects, a store from For Art and Architecture, and I remember that uh, looking at his portfolio, I said to myself, this is the best portfolio. He only showed some details, uh, hinges for doors, or I forgot exactly what they were, but they were beautiful. At that time, he was not famous last, like he is now, but uh, he, he, he was beginning to, 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 you know, uh, to be talked about and to be known. And, uh, once I was even invited in his, um, not by him, but somebody invited me, uh, also people associated with store from for architecture in his studio. And uh, there I saw on a shelf, a book which I didn't know was written by a Romanian, uh, The Geometry of Art and Life by Matila Ghica. And when I saw the name Matila Ghica, I realized that uh, he must be Romanian. And indeed he was and is, and the book is a very good book that uh, Stephen Hall had it on his shelf. He also had a book by Mircea Eliade, The Sacred and the Profane, uh, which I also saw there. So, um, you know, this, this is uh, something that I remember now. Um, I don't know actually, if, no, I don't think it was his birthday. It was not in December. Anyway, Some Watercolors by, uh, by Stephen Hall. I like his watercolors, you know, because they are, uh, yes, they are descriptive. Maybe they are not, uh, you know, so-called masterpieces uh, in terms of watercoloring, but they are his studies. He's uh, um, investigating the ideas that would uh, animate his buildings. And um, I think there is a lot to learn from his, uh, from his watercolors. I mean, the poster I sent out, the, the, if someone looked carefully on that uh, watercolor that I included, it was mentioned, for example, the name of uh, Lao Tzu, uh, the Taoist uh, mystic, the great, uh, uh, the great uh, spiritual force in, uh, in, in China and beyond. And, you know, I think, I think uh, Stephen Hall is one of the few architects today who doesn't neglect meat, who doesn't neglect, neglect uh, spirit. And uh, this is not a little thing. Uh, 
his architecture is innovative, is, uh, is um, adventurous even, at times even audaciously so. And yet, the fact that he uses watercolors says something about him. The watercolor is not a, an aggressive medium. It's hard to be you know, aggressive with watercolors. It's a fragile medium. And look at this watercolor. It is fragile too. It is poetical. And um, some of this poetry, I think, is, is to be found in the buildings themselves. Uh, you see, there is a, a metaphysical thought here, time in four parts. He mentions time, and he doesn't say time is money. Uh, it's about something else. Garden equals thinking equals thinking field, uh, plane of the present. He's also a philosopher, you know, intersection in torsion. Uh, and today I wrote a short uh, text and I will, I will send it out uh, very soon, Architecture and Metaphysics. And I, I, I started from the quotation from uh, Johann Helsinko who said, and I, I mentioned it the other day, that uh, when culture doesn't aspire towards the metaphysics is 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 uh, is is losing itself it's not culture any longer so on one hand johan huizinko on the other hand alvar alto who said architecture belongs to culture not to civilization well if we if we, we, we consider simultaneously the, stu, the two statements, the conclusion is that only when aspires towards metaphysics or towards the metaphysical, architecture is cultural or culture. And if it doesn't do so, it's not culture. And if it's not culture, it's not even architecture. So to me, it's so clear that these two important thinkers and Alvar Aalto, no one would deny that was one of the most important modern architects. They both said the same thing. Architecture must assume metaphysics. And if it doesn't, it's not architecture any longer. It is as simple as this. Stephen Hall understood this. He is one of the few architects who doesn't neglect metaphysics. We must strive towards metaphysics. We must struggle if the struggle is needed. We should never forget metaphysics because if you remove metaphysics from the physicality of architecture, because yes, architecture does work with physics, does work with materials, with matter, but it doesn't remain there. If it remains there, it's a building at the most, but not architecture pamphlet architecture, he started to publish himself, by himself, with his own money, uh, a small magazine, architectural magazine. It was his attempt to le fait, towards Le Fait Senou. In other words, through his personal uh, involvement, uh, he wanted to open up the discourse about architecture. So he published, when he was younger, this uh, small uh, brochure, um, modest in terms of, uh, you know, uh, graphics or the logistics of publication, you know, but very significant. And now this pamphlet architecture is very searched for. It can be, it can be purchased, it can be found. But again, we are dealing with an architect who understood that it is important to manifest himself in this way as well. And here are some, uh, uh, you know, uh, examples, you know, some cover pages of this um, uh, publication. Publi pamphlet architecture number two, uh, bridge of houses, pamphlet architecture. Uh, another one, uh, uh, number nine, he was, uh, promoting his ideas and other people's ideas through this uh, publication that he, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, generated and, and paid for. Now, we, unfortunately, I'm beginning to be already a little unsatisfied with this presentation, but I try to remain optimistic and spontaneous. It's not chronological. Perhaps it should be chronological. 
I begin now with the chapel of St. Ignatius, uh, and I don't know exactly why I began with it, but uh, please bear with me, and I hope you will not regret that you did or do. Uh, this is a, um, you know, uh, a building uh, he built in Seattle. Uh, it's a church, and it's a church which, of course, would make uh, the Orthodox, uh, uh, you know, people or uh, you know those serving uh, the church here uncomfortable. But uh, I keep saying, in as much as in order to preserve culture, we must create it. Is the same in the world of spirit. In order to, to uh, keep or to preserve faith, we must create it. And you cannot create it by imitating past forms. Uh, you have to create it in, in, a, in a way which is uh, both respectful, but also respectful for our, your time and place. Uh, and uh, you know, we saw the church by Paul Briggs built in, in his uh, hometown. Now we see a church built by, um, Stephen Hall in Seattle, and they do have to an extent, um, uh, Stephen Hall is a more reticent architect than, uh, than uh, Volprix, but he could be uh, uh, audacious too in a more uh, you know, discreet form if we are to, uh, if I am to express myself a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, oxymoronically, yes. Anyway, this is the church he built, and you saw a watercolor uh, before uh, that uh, was done as a study for this church. Um, yes, there is even playfulness. There is also uh, reverence. Uh, there are maybe even some uh, uh, more or less uh, discreet uh, references to the Zen garden in Kyoto. Uh, it's about a spirit. It's about a quest for spirit from today and from uh, from that uh, geographical space for which he built. Uh, again, you know, the traditionalist would say this is not a church, but uh, the traditionalist is just one human presence on this earth, in, uh, even if there are many, but there are other opinions as well. Uh, Anyway, uh, you see a concern for light. Well, light is very important if we talk about spirit. And uh, light was uh, carefully considered in this building and the mystery of light. I mean, you know, this vertical element is also created you know, in a creative way, if I am to express myself redundantly. Again, you know, you are supposed to be creative if you work for none other than the house of God. Uh, why is this is not understood in our country? I do not know. I don't think it's, I, I, I mean, I really don't know. I, I don't know why orthodoxy is so stubborn in changing nothing. Because I'm absolutely sure the, the fathers of the church here, they use laptops, they use computers, they use uh, iPhones and iPads and so on. They use the plane, they use the car. Well, how come architecture is not evolving? You see the question mark there, Bartles. He was asking himself, the chapel of St. Ignatius. 
uh, bottles of light in a stone box, this would be considered or was considered at the time, you know, by him, the conceptual, you know, seed of, of the project. But you see, he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, studying and uh, the world showed this, you know, procession. Uh, you know, he, it's about thinking, essentially. It's 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 a building what which was born from a thinking process, which was creative itself. Was not dogmatic. Was not uh, uh, you know read ad literam in a in, in a book or whatever. It must be beautiful to build in this way, you know, where you create something, something that was not before done, you know. Uh, yes, you assume some risks, but I think they are, you know, they, they are worth it. But sorry for the resolution uh, here. You see, even the way he employed the colors. You see the opposites color, the blue and yellow, yellow and blue, green and red, red and green. He works with pairs of opposites. Uh, and uh, I have a beautiful book, which I actually saw first in the studio of Lebia Suds in New York. Um, the, I mentioned this, this book before. It's truly a very beautiful book, The Sufi Tradition in Persian Architecture. And if you look at the complexities of the spirit of those builders, you can only be, uh, you know, uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, dwarfed almost by by uh, by the philosophy, by the poetry, by the holistic thinking. You know, uh, everything matter. You know, the cardinal point. If the left. Was, op was different from the right. It was a spiritual uh, uh, assessment of a program and thus of a building. And, and Stephen Hall attempts something similar. In his own way, uh, uh, he's, uh, you can tell he's questing for a holistic architecture, if I am to call it so. Let's let's read this. He wrote with his own hand. Uh, the returns. I, I don't see there is he returns to his metaphor of light, the light to perceive what can best be decided upon must come down from the first and supreme wisdom. Exercises of Saint Ignatius. He was reading Saint Ignatius and, and, and he quoted from him. You know, he talks about supreme wisdom. Uh, what can I say? I wish there are more architects who reflect on what is called supreme wisdom and uh, produce a work which is uh, contemporary, which belongs to us, but which is at the same time animated by ideas uh, you know, from a long time ago. Now the Kiasma Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki is a brilliant work and he won the competition. And uh, let me see if I remember what Kiasma meant, is a, is a Greek word. He won the competition and he built in the proximity or the vicinity of the great Finlandia Hall, the Philharmonia of, of, of Helsinki, of Finland by Alvar Aalto. And he was young when he won this competition and he built a building. Let's read, because it's an excellent building. The very concept of an art gallery implies an inward focus. While the need to showcase the cultural treasures contained within is self-evident, the need to connect these sheltered exhibition spaces to the outside world is less so and in some cases is overlooked entirely. Even monumental design that turns the museum itself into a sculptural element may fail to make reference to its particular surroundings. 
this sense of placelessness, I guess this was not written by him, is what Stephen Hall sought to avoid in his design for an art museum at the heart of Helsinki, Kiasma, a museum whose carefully choreographed outward views, formerly irregular gallery spaces, and indeed its very name speak to the ideal of connection. Yes, Kiasma, this is what it means. And uh, I don't have here, I regret. Anyway, this is the building. It's truly about connecting. And I mentioned the other day, you know, those two words from Froster, only connect that Vincent Scully placed as a motto on an article about his friend, Louis Kahn. This is truly the challenge to connect between me and you or between us and them. Le fais et nous, le fais et moi. And here you have two entities that uh, intersect. Uh, I think chiasma has to do with intersection. Is this intersection between two entities which preserve their individuality and yet they connect, they intersect, they come together. And uh, uh, it's, 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 of course, it's a modern work. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's Stephen Holt through and through. It functions well. It also brings in, you know, the I, I like this elevation. You know, it's it's uh, it's both irrational and rational. It's modern through and through. The Kiasma Museum. He brought this this very word became the the name of the museum. It's a creative work, a contemporary work, and it's supposed to be so. And it was not an easy task to build in Helsinki, not far away from a masterpiece by, by the great Alvar Alto. He assumed that difficulty, and I think he responded to it uh, uh, in, a, in a very inspired way. It's almost uh, maybe my uh, approximation is simplistic, but I see it like almost like an expression, an architectural expression of the meeting between reason and unreason, the capriciousness of uh, so called unreason and uh, you know, regularity and uh, modesty in a way of reason. And they meet, they intersect, and then here the point of contact is the staircase, which itself is uh, eventful. It's, it's, it's a possible reading. I don't know if, if he thought exactly in these terms, but chiasma evokes intersection, meeting. And this stair, in a way, is that uh, the space of negotiation, of transition between one and the other. It's not a complicated building, but, but at the same time, it's not a simplistic building. Somehow he expresses in rather simple ways a complex idea. Now, he also built for Knut Hamsun. Who was, who is Knut Hamsun? Knut Hamsun was a writer, a Norwegian writer, a writer who received the Nobel Prize, an excellent, excellent writer. Unfortunately, he sympathized with uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, and uh, for, for that reason, uh, I guess uh, the Norwegians themselves and other people, uh, you know, uh, place him in, uh, in, a, in a shadowed cone 
so to speak, but uh, recently, I mean recently, I think he built this building around 20 years ago. Uh, this center, the Knut Hamsun Center in Norway was built by uh, Stephen Hall. I read only one book by Knut Hamsun, but I loved it. And it is translated in Romanian, hunger, uh, fun. When we ask, uh, I, 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 I imagine it was translated. It's, a, it's not a voluminous book, but it's beautifully written. I truly recommend Knut Hamsun. And as I said, he did receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. But let's, let's read a little bit uh, what uh, Stephen Hall himself said about this. This center dedicated to Hamsun is located above the Arctic Circle near village of Prestide of Hamaroy uh, and, the farm, and the farm where the writer grew up. The museum will include exhibition areas, a library and reading room, a cafe and an auditorium. The concept for the museum is building as a body, creating a battleground of invisible forces. And this battleground can be uh, witnessed and discovered in the writings of Knut Hamsun himself. This is the building here, a beautiful landscape, of course, uh, Norway can be quite dramatic and it was quite inspiring the landscape uh, uh, in, uh, in a brand uh, written by the great, great, great Henry Ibsen, one of the greatest playwriters ever. And I, I recommend, I suggest you read if you can, if you want, Ibsen, Henry Ibsen. He has two plays that are uh, uh, at least potentially interested uh, interesting for architects. Brand and the master builder. Great, 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 great again, great writer. But let's come back to Knut Hamsun. Here are um, scenes from the construction process. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, he is an architect. Stephen Hall is an architect and he paved the way for himself to build for very interesting buildings for very interesting programs. You know, a house, a so-called house for Knut Hamsun in a beautiful uh, setting and landscape. Uh, these are some plans. He's playful. He is rigorous, but he's also playful and capricious if you want, but playfulness is connected with capriciousness. You know, all these elements are, outside of the boxes that break in and, uh, you know, create, create variety. So Stephen Hall is one of the, the most important architects today. He doesn't have a doctorate in architecture. I think he doesn't even have a master in architecture. He has a bachelor in architecture. But an architect doesn't need diplomas. He needs high quality in his work. That's what he needs. This should be understood by certain parts of the world, which value more diplomas than merit. It's an interesting building. It really is. And I like the watercolors uh, again, you know. Uh, you know, here is the, the, the soft conceptual, conceptualization of the project. Uh, I'm sure he read uh, Knut Hamsun before he started to, uh, to draw, to paint, and, and to build. Also in his sketches and his drawings, you can perceive like in here, the presence of the sun. And also the, ang the angle at which at certain times, the sun penetrates the building. So he is concerned with the apparent movement of the sun uh, on the sky. 
this relationship with the sky should not be ignored and in particular with the sun this was done by the, by the most important architects how could you build significantly if you ignore the movement of the sun uh, you know apparent as it is uh, on the sky here he is well we already know by now that architects have a hard time to to choose the correct um, pair of glasses or frames these glasses are not too bad but i have seen him with a um, with some other frames a little bit strange so to speak but then toyo ito also and uh, we know the series of architects who imitated and imitate le corbusier uh, what can we say the horizontal skyscraper well i would i would not have called it a skyscraper if it is horizontal but maybe uh, call it horizon scraper anyway beyond this it's an excellent work done in China, the horizontal skyscraper. It's a large complex of buildings. And maybe some of those people there are architects or maybe just passers by because architecture does animate many people, even the, uh, those so-called, uh, uh, you know, uh, simple people or uh, common people. No, they, you know, people are not insensitive to works which are you know, engaging and enticing and exciting. And this is, you know, it is. It is a modern work which is uh, courageous and, uh, you know, it uh, makes use of the technology which is at our disposal and, and yet finds uh, an architectonic manifestation of the technology that is uh, without uh, being. Uh, you know, uh, not connected with the present, uh, still original. And we see here again uh, his love for stairs. We saw it uh, happening at the Knut Hamsun Museum. We see it here, he built another museum in China where also he takes the, the staircase and places it outside. And of course, the people who ask themselves, how am I to bring the piano to I don't know what floor uh, would be uh, puzzled and perplexed. But, uh, you know, if this is the problem, uh, I guess we can find a way to even bring the piano in if indeed uh, the piano is missing here. Uh, a certain amount of freedom is necessary for architecture to, you know, to breathe, otherwise it suffocates itself and dies. I know some people uh, like in our country, you know, keep referring to the transition. Well, this is China. How come they uh, made this so-called transition uh, much shorter and almost uh, make it disappear? How come, you know, they had a much more stringent communism than we did? Then how come they accommodated themselves to this uh, modernity coming from from none other but uh, the United States. And look at the model of the of the whole building. It's a it's a large uh, it's a large large building. He's not afraid of you know uh, so-called difficult angles like here. You know, the functionalist would, would tremble, would say, whoa, 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 what's this? What is happening there? I mean, as if, uh, you know, uh, in the inner landscape of everybody, we don't have such angles. Dark. We do. It's okay. Not everything has to be 
you know, rationally, uh, so-called rationally uh, plausible or, uh, you know, uh, inviably uh, comfortable. It's okay. There is conflict in, in buildings too. Why not think about that? In as much as there are conflicts within ourselves, why shouldn't we also have conflicts in the buildings that we build in order to express the truth about human life in general? I think it's a very good complex of buildings and I'm happy he be. You see, it is in a way a horizontal skyscraper because at the top we see the Empire State Building and uh, it's almost as long. I mean, it is as long as the, uh, the Empire State Building, isn't it? Also, you, you, you can look at it in a different way and, uh, you know, the profile or, I mean, of the plan. The plan is almost like seeing a diagrammatic representation of some strange anim animal, isn't it? With the head here and the body and the legs and so on. I, I don't know exactly why, why he felt like doing this, but uh, uh, this is not important. He, he built a, a very interesting building and uh, that's it. Unfortunately, I have to remove now so for some reason some uh, uh, picture showed up here. Anyway, is there playfulness here? Yes, there is. And you cannot build significantly without also being playful. These are offices, you know, office, it's an office building, you know. It's, you know, it's destiny, it's the destination, destination it's raison d'etre, it's, uh, you know, uh, business, you know, uh, capitalistic business. What can we do? But he's still playful. You, you can, uh, you, you cannot deny it. Even the colors, you know, look at this color, look at this color, look at this color. There is a level of, uh, you know, non-conventionality. And this is, uh, 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 you know, a normal so-called expression of uh, the playful, playfulness of the one who is creative. I like also the way the landscape is left, you know, natural, you know, it just grows. It's not manicured, it's not domest domesticated. So you see here the dialectics between architecture and nature. It's fine. Um, so Stephen Hall in China, look at that redness. Bravo to him. Now the Cranbrook Institute of Science, uh, I love this work. Uh, he has some exquisite uh, small works, you know, little jewels, you know, this is one of them. It's, it's very simple, it's a small work. But I think, you know, in this corner, the way he, the way he um, you know, brings in the, 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 the pair of what he calls idea and phenomena, you know, is, is um, it becomes eventful, uh, this, this corner. And with simple means, essentially, he created this window which is, uh, you know, refusing to be pinned down by dogma. Otherwise, the building is very simple. No, we have here a cube, and we have here an extension, which is in no way, you know, uh, trying to scream anything uh, dramatic. But this corner, I think, it's it's architecture at its best. It's 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 also not mimicking the steel from the Netherlands. It's, Although some I see some relationship, but the colors, the atmosphere are different. And yet there are echoes maybe coming from there too. I like this work very much. I don't know about the lion there, but that's not his work. Uh, Life on Earth, this is uh, you know, a banner uh, placed there by who knows who. Uh, but this is, in my opinion, is architecture and is, uh, is, uh, is brilliantly done, although you know, in simple ways, actually. I don't think he used like Le Corbusier, you know, a modular or anything like that, but in, you know, uh, intuitively, he created a window that is eventful and acting as a catalyst for the entrance into this Cranbrook Institute of Science.
and it's crafted very well, you know. I mean, yes, modernistically, you know, nothing, uh, you know, very polished or anything. You see, you see how the thing was done, but I think it's done uh, in an inspiring way. And again, it's about the poetry of building, the poetry of imagining architecture uh, uh, beyond the conventions and so on. Now he also had a change. He made this change for himself, and uh, Macintosh, uh, his birthday will come soon. Extension to Macintosh, Charles Macintosh, fam famous Glasgow School of Art. He had a chance to build in the proximity of Alvar Aalto. Now he has the chance to build in the proximity of the great building by the great architect and designer and watercolorist like himself, uh, Charles Rene Macintosh in Glasgow, the Glasgow School of Art, the Seona Ride building in Glasgow. So here it is. Stephen Hall with a modern building, with a contemporary building, which is not afraid to manifest itself with its time and place distinctly from what Charles Rennie Macintosh did across the street. Because the dialectics between the past and the present should be, uh, should reflect actually the, the reality of, of life. Um, so this is his building where well, we, I hope I have also images with um, with the two buildings in there is a nice uh, uh, drawing uh, showing both Macintosh's uh, building and his building and uh, the dialogue between them, uh, which doesn't um, erase the individually. I, I mean, you know, if he was a timid architect, he would have uh, been uh, very, very reticent. He is respectful, but he's also manifesting his own architecture vis-a-vis uh, -vis the one by uh, Charles Rennie Macintosh. You see, he mentions in his, uh, here you see the, the, the relationship. This is the building by Charles Rennie Macintosh, and this is the building with a, in a section by uh, um, Stephen Hall. And he compares, you know, he finds inspiration because he does believe in context as well, but in a dynamic way. And he doesn't believe only in the physical context, but also in the metaphysical context, because there is such a thing as metaphysical context. So thin bones, steel wood, thick skin, stone, and he, well, he does here thick bones, concrete, and thin skin, recycled double glass. So let's look here we have thin bones, here we have thick bones. Here we have thick thin skin, here we have thin skin. So you know he's playing with opposites. He's playing it is about relationship, it is about you know a chiasma at a metaphysical level but manifested through the physical. You know, there is, there is a dialogue between the two, but, uh, but also, you know, like playing in an in and yang way. You know, this is not imitating what is going on here, yet it refers to what is going on here. Bravo to him. And by the way, Stephen Hall wrote to me that he would love to come to Tergujiu to see the uh, the endless column by Brancusi. <laughs> yes, at seventy something. Yes, still learning, still curious, and still respecting the greatness of true art. And by the way, of Brancusi, I have to say that Wolf Prix, whom I mentioned, considered and considers Brancusi the best uh, artist of the twentieth century. He was generous. I don't know. Uh, there are many, there were many, or there is a number, a certain number of great architect, artists in the 20th century. 
but uh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, not to be neglected that an architect like uh, Paul Frix appreciates so much Brancusha, and so does uh, the North American Stephen Hall, since he wants, you know, at, a, you know, at the age he has, to come to Turgujiu to see the endless column. Great art inspires, that's why. And great art doesn't have frontiers. You have an Austrian architect, you have a North American architect, both understanding, you know, the, the value of Konstantin Brancusi's works. Again, how many architects today do so many watercolors? I mean, it's, prob it's, prob it's possible probably to, to fill a whole museum just with the sketches that Stephen Hall did studying you know the programs of the buildings uh, he he built and and builds and will build so here we see you know charles rennie mcintosh here we see stephen hall and uh, here we see them again you know this is not mimicking this building it's distinct and yet you feel that there is a dialogue between the two that this building is not turning its back on what Macintosh uh, did, and indeed, how could he? Uh, and and he, uh, look at here, you know, what architect today, I mean, there are a few, but not many, who consider so carefully the, the sunlight and the relationship of the sunlight with the, with, with the building they built. He did and does, and uh, we can only applaud him for this. He also considers the light coming from the north in the studios because it's an art school. So it's all about relationships. You see, it's, it's about connection. Only connect, let's not forget, only connect. Are they in love with each other, these two buildings? Probably, maybe one day they will get married. In a way, they even got married already because uh, I'm sure they, they look with sympathy towards each other. Charles McIntosh created uh, this building and Stephen Hall created this building and they interact as they should. You see here these esoteric angles, 57 degrees, the summer maximum, uh, you know, uh, the summer equinox, or no, the summer solstice. And then you have the, the, the smallest 11 degrees of the winter solstice. So right here, we see clearly that Stephen Hall is concerned about, well, I don't think I'm too rhetorical if I say cosmos, about the relationship between his building and what is outside of this building, and not only at the level of the street, but also at the level of, of the above, the sky, the sun, its rays at the summer solstice and the winter solstice, uh, which is approaching actually in a few days. Uh, and it's not an accident that uh, Christmas was actually removed from January, the birth of Christ, close to, uh, you know, the, the winter solstice in December. Why do you think this was done? Well, because uh, the, birth, the birth of, uh, of Christ is uh, an equivalent of the birth of light. Because after, I don't know if this year is the 21st of December, or the 22nd of December. But anyway, after the winter solstice, the day begins to grow gradually and slowly. In other words, is the birth of light, the birth of day, and, and, and symbolically is, uh, is uh, represented by the birth of Christ, the birth of, uh, yes, of, of, of spirituality in, uh, in Christianity. They are related because as I said, initially, 
Christmas was in January, not in December. There is much to learn from Stephen Hall. We saw already this um, uh, sketch. He's also assuming conflict because conflict is part of life. We read here abrasive collisions. I don't know exactly what he was uh, searching for, but uh, um, you know, this was a dialogue with himself. He made them not for other people to, it, it was his, his studying the problem of the, this museum, how this museum was supposed to come into being. And um, I think he succeeded. But what do we see in this sketch, in this watercolor, you know? A continuous dialogue between the, the rooms and, uh, and light, you know, sunlight or otherwise uh, a re possible relationship with the building across the street. And it's, 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 it's in these hand, handmade, uh, you know, drawings and watercolors, he's investigating the very substance, functional and, and uh, uh, metaphorical of his building. One day, probably I will send him a little box uh, with uh, pioneer watercolors from Bucharest because I really think, and I know I did watercolors too in my life a lot. I love those watercolors. They are excellent. I hope they are still as good as they were, uh, you know, before 1989. They were absolutely magnificent and they even look good as, as the little box and so on. Um, and of course, I, I, I became even more appreciative of, of it when I, I, I realized that uh, a friend, France or French made uh, identical uh, uh, little box with watercolors costs uh, $100, while here is not even $1. Anyway, um, Stephen Hall in Glasgow. Well, I go a little bit quicker because it's, uh, we, we still have uh, many other works by him to show, I told you I have 365 images and I could have had double of that if I included the, his latest works and some of other works. He built a lot, he drew a lot, he painted a lot with watercolors. He thought a lot about architecture and he still has time to create gatherings, uh, you know, at his, I think it's called Tea Foundation in the woods of um, Rhinebeck, uh, New York for poetry, for exhibitions and so on. It's a life totally dedicated to creativity, to art, to architecture and so on. Now, this office is in Amsterdam. Let's see, on the single canal, this renovated building is the former federal warehouse of medical supplies. The main structure is a four story brick U merging internally with a new sponge pavilion on the canal. While the exterior expression is one of complementary contrast, existing brick adjacent to new perforated copper, the interior strategy is one of fusion. It's fusion. I like this building too. It's similar to the one he did at Cranbrook, the Cranbrook uh, building for science. I think it's exquisite. It's very simple, it's discreet. It has a reticence, but he's, uh, he can be a very, subtle um, poet of reticence in architecture. And he built in Amsterdam, a building which, uh, uh, in my opinion, adds something to the, you know, to the existing situation. It's not all aspects of his architecture are spectacular. He's not a flamboyant creator like Frank Gehry, for example. He uses, uh, you know, more or less simple geometries, but I think he's able to differentiate in qualitative terms between, uh, you know, certain aspects and certain functions uh, and certain even symbolism of his buildings. I like the way he treated this facade. You know, it's, uh, it's, um, it, it's resolute in terms of geometry, but it's also discrete. And even at night, I think it, 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 uh, 
while it is so distinct from the other buildings, the existing buildings, it's also a building which is not accepting itself in uh, aggressive forms at all. These smaller buildings by, by, uh, by Stephen Hall, I think, uh, are, are excellent. Now, the New York uh, University Department of Philosophy, where he experienced with what he called porosity, and porosity is indeed important if you want to connect to arrive at that chiasma of intersections of meetings between sometimes opposite forces of uh, uh, so uh, you see the way light is filtered through these capriciously pierced uh, opaque surfaces it's uh, it's an art to be able to create to bring porosity in and he does so this is almost like an uh, embroidery Embro it's an embroid uh, an em how is it called now i'm beginning to to lose it uh, embroider embroider no, it doesn't sound right, but you understand. Uh, broderie in Romanian. Embroidered. Pa pardon? Embroidered. Embroidered. I don't know why I, the word didn't sound right. Embroidered is embroidered, and it, it's 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 fine. It's textile work in a way, uh, and uh, yeah, he does so, something like this as well. You know, and by the way, the embroidery, I will launch a competition for Christmas, an embroidered house in Bethlehem, which refers to, of course, uh, to the birth of Christ, but also refers to the fact that Bethlehem had a great tradition in textile works and embroideries. How do you do an embroidered house uh, in Bethlehem? This is the challenge. And I think it's a beautiful challenge, but it's a beautiful challenge which uh, uh, very few people will uh, will uh, accept to uh, uh, deal with because you know there are no prizes, there is no. But who knows? Who knows? Make a beautiful embroidered house for Bethlehem, and uh, who knows? Maybe one day you'll uh, implement it, you'll build it some way, if not in Bethlehem. Anyway, porosity in uh, New York City, the New York University by Stephen Hall. Now, now the White House, which is an excellent house. Uh, look at the plan. Again, the, the minor, I would say, functionalist would say, what is this nonsense with this, uh, you know, uh, well, what can you do in this space? You know, it's so narrow. Uh, forget the minor functionalist. You know, look at this building. There is duality, there is a schism, there is separation, and yet it's one single house. I think uh, Stephen Hall understood that you have unity, but you also have separation. And this was, uh, both sides were present in the alchemical process. In order to arrive at unity, you also have to separate, separatio, and then conjunction. Here we have, we have the schism, and it happens that I like dualities, and I like this house too, uh, which is a single house, but it has a built-in duality. Oh, we could call this in many ways. Is this the the part of the building that we could say it, it's the sun building and this is the moon building like we have on the elevation, the western elevation of Chartres Cathedral, where one tower belongs is, you know, described as honoring the sun and the, the older one honoring the moon. Oh, you could use the masculine principle and the feminine principle or you could even reverse. Maybe this is the masculine, represents the masculine principle, and this the feminine principle. That is, if we arrive at a much desired uh, matriarchy. For the moment, we still have patriarchy, don't we? Uh, we also see the duality and the conflict, in a way, the dialectics between the green of nature and the redness of architecture. An architecture, even when architecture essentially is red 
in its very essence because it's a human artifact and it's built uh, you know with uh, often with the materials that even uh, employed fire explicitly in its making like steel or or iron um, and studies for the house what a pleasure he must have had you know conceiving all these projects and drawing them with watercolors and then asking himself questions and showing arrows and why it exactly it is called the well we'll see why graphically but maybe there is more to it the white house because it's almost like letter y now linked hybrid in china another excellent work an ample work and here he invited his friend Lebius Woods whom I mentioned uh, earlier uh, to build something and the, as far as I know it's the only thing that Lebius Woods built and it's thanks to to Stephen Hall because he insisted that uh, his friend build something there we'll take a look at it now here we see buildings which in my opinion dance together like in that famous painting by Matisse, the dance. It's, you know, these building, buildings are really like a, in Romanian a horror. They, they, they dance together. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, again, it's about bringing together. Here he brought together several buildings. I didn't count them. I don't know, six, seven or something like this. Uh, he also employs uh, pr primary colors. And, uh, you know, uh, they are on the side of those openings, but still, uh, uh, you know, noticeable. Unfortunately, I don't know. I, I said this last year and I say it again. I hope it was not him. Although today I am not so much uh, turned off by these buildings in the center. Initially, they were not here. I don't know if he built them or someone else. Maybe I'm, I'm coming to terms with them. I like the buildings around them um more yeah from the top well, it looks okay i guess but then the 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 facades are very grayish while here there are some colors plus there is the movement provoked by these bridges that unite the unite the buildings look also uh, at the structure of the building at these diagonals you know which uh, would would again agitate the the simplistic mind of the rationalist but uh, Stephen Hall uh, doesn't have a simplistic mind and he understands that life without uh, diagonals is uh, can be unbearable although he built a few buildings like the preview, uh, previous one we saw where there are no diagonals but often he does employ them um, I'm not talking about the White, White House. I'm talking about the, the work in Amsterdam. And also the Krembrook Academy, uh, the Krembrook uh, Pavilion or Building of Science for Science. China. Why is China experimenting so much? And why is it that we don't? Uh, we could say yes china is doing very well economically well it's doing very well economically because it desired to do very well economically and they understood that in order to progress they need high technology something we here in romania do not understand you need to be at the forefront of, of the present in order to anticipate the future they also invite architects like Stephen Hall and many others to build in their country, something we could do too, and we don't. So we talk about them and they don't talk about us. That's what it is. Yes, these, these buildings, I, I I wish they were done differently. I wish, I don't know. I, I find them less inspiring than the ones around, but, uh, and I hope actually, I wish he didn't build them. Um, anyway, 
I could be subjective too. It's it's my opinion. I, I'm not a god. I, I feel in this way. I could be wrong, but uh, that's what I feel. So here is the site plan and the top view. You know, here are the dancing characters uh, in the painting of Matisse, and uh, I think again he did a good job here. And there is again that playfulness without which again creativity cannot truly really be. Do these apartments function? Of course they function. You know, they do function. But there is that's that's where the metaphysical manifests itself. You know, uh, yes, they are apartment buildings. Okay. But why did, was he concerned about uniting them in this way? And why do we have here two systems, so to speak? One strict and rational, a grid, and then the arbitrariness of these diagonals. Because they represent the capriciousness of the other forces of life, you know, and they do exist. And if we deny it, we deny truth. They do exist accidents matter and they do exist the the ale aleatory side of life is 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 a reality this is not normative architecture let's uh, let's uh, say it it's an architecture which is creative and which is a a, a, a genuine expression of uh, what life is and life is uh, both uh, rational and irrational. It's not just rational and it's not just irrational, it's both. Maybe most of his works are exactly about both. If you know that painting by Matisse, I think you would, uh, you would uh, agree with me that uh, the you know, the parallel is not totally inappropriate. I see these buildings connecting. They have their own individuality and yet they dance together. Now we look at, at, at the contribution by his friend, Lebius Woods, A Space of Light. And last year we had a chance when we paid homage to Lebius Woods to also have here on Zoom his assistant who actually worked on this very project that you are going to see now, which was built, was realized. And he was very nice. An Austrian architect who teaches in the United States, in New York, at Cooper Union, at Columbia, I think. And um, uh, yes, we, last year we were for four hours on Zoom and there were many, many people here, including Stephen Hall, and Wolf Prix for uh, not a long time. This is what Levius Woods did. This is the disturbance, if we are to call it so, of Levius Woods within the framework of his friend Stephen Hall. So what you see around was done by Stephen Hall and what you see here was done by Levius Woods. And you can see on YouTube a video with uh, Stephen Hall uh, in exaltation in this very space. He was animated by the so-called disturbance of Lebia Suits. Here are some, uh, you know, uh, renderings, if I am to call them so, drawings uh, of, of, of what was built there, some images from inside. Uh, Stephen Hall declared that, uh, you know, it, it was hard to convince the client to build this thing because it was uh, actually very expensive and very big. But in the end, he, he, he managed to convince him to, to build this rather extravagant, uh, you know, so-called accident in this complex of buildings by telling him that these things will, uh, will uh, because they are light boxes or light columns or whatever we want to call them. They, they emanate light at night. So they bring light into the courtyard, the space in between the buildings. 
and there is uh, uh, this uh, Michael Blackwood uh, Productions release. Uh, you can see it on YouTube, Levia Suze and Stephen Hall, The Practice of Architecture, where they talk and uh, they show this work in China. Here is Levia Suze. Hello, Levius. How are you? Uh, one day we will meet. Uh, he died in 2012. Uh, and uh, yeah. He created this thing. The, apparently, this useless thing. But but let's not forget what John Ruskin said: that the most beautiful things in life are the most useless. And he gave us an example: the peacock's tail, the tail of the peacock, and uh, the lily, the beautiful flower. Um, I would say there is some truth there, you know, and. Uh, Perhaps the functionalist should be a little bit uh, less rigid and less dogmatic. Here is Stephen Hall in ecstasy in that space uh, created by uh, his friend Lebia Suits in China. Do you see? You see, they are like children. They are playful. Yes, sometimes you know there is a level of irresponsibility, but. But try to imagine having such a big uh, project, uh, you know, having the chance to build it in China. He builds it, and he builds it, I think, in, uh, in convincing ways. And then he still wants more, and he invites his friend. He's not egocentric. He, he wants to uh, allow his friend to manifest him with his difference within his own work. So here is a book that was published. The Light Pavilion by Levia Suds, and uh, that's uh, Kampusch. Uh, he is Christoph Kampusch, the, the, the Austrian architect who was with us uh, last year uh, on, on the birthday of Levia Suds. And he had a, an extensive dialogue with the students. There were many students, not just from Romania, but also from other countries, because Levia Suds is very admired. So, the porosity block in Chengdu in China, built between 2007 and 2012 when Lebia Suits died. Now, so Shanghai, this Kofco Cultural and Health Center, uh, this is, I, I don't know if it was built. Uh, yes, it's, it, it was, when I made this presentation last year, it was still in the process of becoming, meaning uh, it was still being built. But uh, you see here another side of uh, Stephen Hall, also creative. Uh, you know, he is uh, he's challenging himself. Here we almost see echoes, if I can so uh, say so, of the moon, the two moons building by Moon Hoon in South Korea. Uh, but even here we see dualities. You know, two parts. You know, uh, having a dialectical relationship between them. There is unity, but there is also a break. There is a, the rift, and there is the con conjunction. Both. This is the model uh, of the of the of the of the buildings. The facade of this building is a little bit similar to a library he built and completed uh, rather recently in Queens, uh, New York. And I hope I have that project here. Yes, unfortunately, it is used a lot of concrete, but what can we do? You know, it's, um, it's still a material hard to, um, you know, totally, um, you know, uh, avoid. Although perhaps we should avoid it, considering that it does pollute. So former communists, these uh, Chinese people, are building these things by a North American architect. Bravo to them. You know, they open up they, and, and they accepted the challenge. And not only they accepted it, they pay for it. And they pay for it. At this moment, China is the most experimental land in the field of architecture in the world. How come they had the, the most stringent communism, the most rigid, 
and now they are open. How come? What made this transformation possible? Now, uh, work at MIT, which is also brilliant, uh, as brilliant, but in a different way as the dormitory by um, uh, Alvar Alto, it seems he, he, it happens that he has a dialogue with Alvar Alto. Here is another dormitory built by Stephen Hall, but in the same, in the same campus, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So let's read, when Massachusetts Institute of Technology commissioned Stephen Hall in 1999 to design a new uh, dormitory for the school, they had one goal in sight, that the spaces around and within the building would stir up interaction among students. Interaction, let's not forget this word. While MIT focused on the building's use and function, Hall aimed to create a memorable building. With MIT's vision in mind, along with Hall's artistic architectural ideas, the 10-story undergraduate dormitory became a small city in itself with balancing oppo opposing architectural elements such as solids and voids and opaqueness and transparency. And I have to see here that the mechanical engineer for this project became a friend of ours and he even made the presentation here and was present many times. And I regret he is not now, but he contributed to this building as a mechanical engineer, as he also contributed uh, with, uh, in the same field for the uh, Church of the Millennium in Rome by uh, Richard Meyer and other, and other important buildings. I'm talking about Mahadev Rahman. And if you want to see his uh, presentation on this Zoom platform, you can go to YouTube and look for Mahadev Rahman and you are going to see it. This is the building by Stephen Hall, uh, and uh, I think it's one of his best buildings. Look at the sketch of the section, the longitudinal section. You know why did he create it? Why did he create uh, this? Uh, you know, uh, almost unexplainable things, spaces within the, you know, the the fabric, so to speak, of the building. And they, they seem so, you know, to contradict structure, to contradict everything, because these are the, these are the spaces of interaction. These are the spaces also, you know, uh, penetrated by light. These are the spaces of, of disjunction. Uh, Bernard Chumi wrote a book about architectural disjunctions. We need conjunction, but we also need disjunction. And here we have these disjunctions. You know, and and this brings in dynamics. It's a dynamic space. It's conflict, yes, between this and this, but life has both. And uh, you know, it's again a, a quest for freedom and for interaction, for something dynamic, something to break. What's going on here? Uh, I don't understand. Uh, The presentation cannot end here. The presentation is much longer. I don't understand. Please forgive me. I don't understand why there were some. Anyway, I'm glad that, uh, but I should have had more images. Maybe something happened. Actually, when I download, when I, when I um, brought back this presentation into my, laptop because it was stored. I kept receiving messages that, uh, you know, uh, Power, PowerPoint has difficulty to recuperate some. Maybe that's what it was. There were some more images relating to that work. I apologize that they didn't. Uh, and I, I thought it was repaired, the PowerPoint, but I see it wasn't. Anyway, um, you know the work, the MIT dormitory, and if you are interested in it, you can see more pictures, of course, on, 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 on the web. Now we look at the Horizon House from 2017. Oh, no. You see, I, I was sure no, something is wrong here. I, I really regret. It seems the, 
these USB sticks on which I save my PowerPoints, uh, some, sometimes they damage, the, they don't save them properly, Ocean, oceanic retreat. Here I see all of a sudden that uh, there are images again. I apologize. Uh, this is not what, this is not how I created the PowerPoint. And last year it went fine, but this year it seems, anyway, this is a, uh, now I'm disturbed and I, I lose my self-confidence, but I hope I can, uh, I can recuperate it. This is a project actually. It was not built the oceanic uh, retreat, but we see dualities here as well, like uh, in, in the previous cases. I'm really agitated now. Why did uh, the PowerPoint um, become uh, damaged? The planner house, the text description provided by the architects, site is seated, sited in Paradise Valley with a direct vista to Camelback Mountain. This house is to be a part of, the, of a vessel for a large contemporary art collection. Anyway, uh, and uh, yeah, this is a building that um, shows the, the dispersion of a house at the top on the on the terrace you know you you wouldn't say that this is a house but it is a house yes as an art gallery and we see here so i mean it has an art gallery because it has many artworks we see the porosity uh, concept so to speak applied that uh, which is also decorative and ornamental so you can see that uh, stephen hall does not turn his back on ornamentation um that the house seems to be monolithical, but also is composed of fragments. The fragments do exist. And uh, so there is continuity and break. And the break is and, and uh, externalized by fragments. And otherwise, the, there is unity. There is unity and multiplicity. There is both, or there are both. Anyway, uh, the drawings, it's, you, know, you see, it's almost a house like a city or like a, as, a, as even Palladio wrote, that the villa should be like the interior a villa like the street and the street like the city and vice versa. They reflect each other. If you look at this elevation, you would say it's the elevation of a you know, rather large part of a city. Well, it's not, it's a villa, it's a, a single building. Not the smallest building in the world, but uh, a building, one single building. Maybe here, very discreet and indirect uh, reference to Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier, maybe. A detail, a functional detail having to do with, um, you know, with the energy evaporate cooling and all the rest is thinking of these matters as well. A cool pool there. There is not just playing with forms. Now the Campbell Sports Center in New York City, uh, good work again. Uh, you know, uh, I passed by this work. I didn't stop, but uh, I should have stopped. You see that how, the, how he brings in again, or out actually, the, the staircases, you know, as, a, as, a, as an attempt to have a dialogue between the building and the city, you know, to, it's about communication, it's about also the dialectics between his building and the city. That's his way of breaking the box. And we see sketches, uh, you know, watercolors exploring this. Yes, there is a capriciousness here too, but again, capriciousness is part of life and we should acknowledge it and we should express it.
Now, X of in-house, we are now, uh, uh, this is interesting actually, it's more theoretical, uh, text description by the architect, the X of in, you see, the X of in, and you could also say, talk about the in of X, the X of in, in a way here are represented by these stairs. Uh, the X of in house explores a language of space aimed at inner spatial energy strongly bound to the ecology of the place. Questioning current, current cliches of architectural language and commercial practice. The house is a built manifestation of the research and development project explorations of in and the development of Stephen Hall architects since June 2014. And here uh, he wrote like a short manifesto, seven point manifesto for explorations of in. One, to study architecture freed from the purely objective. You see, architecture is also about subjectivity, about unreason. And we should acknowledge it because it's part of ourselves, it's part of life. From origins of architecture, we explore in, in all space is sacred, sacred space. This is what he wrote. The architecture of in dominates space via space. Intrinsic in is an elemental force of sensual beauty. Six, in is useless, but in the future will be used. Purpose finds in. Seven, the thing containing is not the thing contained. Very interesting, you know. Uh, even this statement, provocative as it is, in is useless, but in the future will be used. Purpose finds in. This is in the very opposi opposition of the precepts of functionalism, which try to tell you in is, has to have a use, and that use has to be anticipated and projected and so on, and leaves you no freedom, you as a user, you are actually used for the purpose that the architect imagined is serving you. We are actually used, we are manipulated by the functionalist buildings, which do not, do not allow us to, to be their discoverers. They use us instead of us using them. This is the truth about the so-called functionalist architecture. Uh, spherical intersections. Um, he built a house for himself like this, and you are going to see it. This house, it was built. Um, I hope I have pictures of it here. Now I'm a little bit afraid of all that um, you know, drama. For me, it was a little drama, maybe not so little, because I like to make my presentation as well as I can. And uh, when technology is uh, playing uh, tricks on me, I become, uh, I feel nervous and uh, vulnerable. Anyway, we see here an exploration of the broken cube, the sphere in some kind of a tension dialogue with the cube and all these voids, uh, in a way, try to destroy the inness of the cube to bring the X in. And he succeeds actually. Uh, I hope I have pictures of it. It was built. Uh, um, it's in, 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 in upstate New York where he has the T Foundation, where he invites people, visitors live there and, uh, for a while, and there are artistic and cultural events. Perhaps just like Paul Briggs, he thinks in the same way that if you only think of architecture, you only get architecture. And uh, we shouldn't do that. Uh, and he doesn't do that. I mean, he's obviously an architect, but an architect also has other interests, you know, poetry, philosophy, religion, even, uh, or spirituality, better said, perhaps mythology, and so on. And of course, water coloring. I have to redo this uh, presentation. I have too many models and drawings here. And here it is, the building finally in Rhinebeck, New York. Uh, and uh, 
it's playful. Well, it's also serious. It's not arrogant. It's a small building, but it has its uh, its degree of freedom obtained through bringing the X in in. And uh, look at this corner. You know, it's it's uh, it's fragile. It's ambiguous is i mean look he also the lamps he probably designed the lamps as well uh it's 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 yes it's 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 uh it's it's a geometry which opens up opens up and receives the unexpected uh you know and here you you wonder a little bit it's it's a fragile context where the glass is also on the on the floor and there is a chair on the glass so i guess if you sit on this chair and you look at nature you look at the trees and you feel perhaps a little bit uneasy you know sitting comfortably or so so comfortably on a on a plane of glass but i guess i guess i'm trying to imagine i didn't visit this house but i imagine this makes you uh, obtain that uh, fragility that is actually the truth about human existence you contemplate what is not you but you are part of that is nature and then uh, you know i don't know i don't know what what he wanted to say here it's not i'm sure he didn't want to to say it architecturally in a in a dogmatic or programmatic way it's architecture is poetry at its best and uh, you know certain things cannot be explained rationally or not everything can be explained rationally it's a sim it's, it's a modest house it's a small house but it's also a playful house and um, i think it's nice uh, he built a few others i hope them i have them here maybe less spectacular but uh, um, i would say significant interesting he has here well, he uses it at a table, but this is actually a bench that Toyo Ito designed um, for a project he built in uh, in, uh, in Japan. Now, again, the functional is to ask the question: Why did this have to be this way? You know, because the functionalist always wants rational explanations of everything you know i'm tired of the functionalist i really am now the glassell school of art uh it's uh, it's another art building that he built um should i read all of this uh, i don't know let's read the three-story glassell school of art provides state-of-the-art studios and active social spaces the bbva i don't know what that is the roof garden and idea center i saw the name of isamu noguchi that's what made me uh, begin to read uh, plus also serve the expanding needs of the school and the unique mix of students again it's about interaction the mix the mix mixing the students bringing them together cited on two acres adjoining, adjoining too many names here but it is a sculpture garden designed by isam noguchi uh, who also you know who worked with uh, uh, constantin brancuch uh, an important sculptor isam noguchi the building replaces the school's 1979 facility and this is the the building uh you can see clearly that this interior is uh, you know encouraging people to interact i don't think this is one of his greatest buildings but um, it is present in this presentation uh also a rather unusual now to have these silhouettes here you know uh, not seen clearly but still perceivable by the children here in the in the classroom anyway he built it
Yes, by uh, by next year, I will probably re make another another presentation. Some of these are, um, you know, a little too much information about certain projects like this one. And he, he has many new works and those works should be known and should be seen. But you'll, you'll see a few more. This one I love, the Lewis Arts Complex in Princeton, New Jersey, part, part, part of the, uh, what he built there is, is excellent, is this one. You know, look at, look at this facade. You know, you have a unifying glass facade, which is, you would say, it's monolithical, but it's transparent. It's not, you know, it's not aggressive physically. But behind it, we have the playfulness of smaller parts, the multiplicity of which is acknowledged and expressed. And there are views of this um, elevation, which are, I, I think, very poetical. I, I will be honest with you, this turns me off. Uh, this I don't like. Sorry, Stephen, I'm telling you what I feel and what I think. This I don't like. This to me is not exceptional architecture. You, you know much better. But uh, uh, he probably even designed the rug because uh, it seems to be his, his, his way of manipulating forms. But there, is, there are things here that, in my opinion, are, are very nice. Not so much the interior. But as I said, that, that building, and I hope I have other pictures with it. But let's read a little bit on, on his watercolor. A thing within a thing a thing in the world appears, dance, music. It's clear to me that Stephen Hall is thinking of things outside of architecture. You know, that's why these words are, are underlined, uh, you know, like uh, dance and music. And above, I couldn't see because I see the, I, I have the, the tab with these functions of Zoom, poetry. So we see a triad. Uh, I don't understand what is happening today. Maybe I'm too emotional. But we see three big, I mean, uh, words written with capital letters. Poetry at the top, dance at the bottom on the left, and music on the right side. I don't think this is an accident. It shows his priorities. He wanted to serve through his buildings, poetry, dance, and music. Poetry, I would say, not accidentally at the top. Uh, and uh, um, let's uh, let's uh, let's hope we have other pictures with this building. Yes, look at this building. It's 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 Cartesian and it's not Cartesian. It's ambiguous and it's clear. There are reflections. There is the water in front of it. There is the almost rational or rationalistic uh, uh, grid or frame in front, but then behind is something else, there are small windows, there are small cubicles. So I like this ambiguity, this dialogue between um, unity and multiplicity. Uh, and uh, it, 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 this is uh, shown both during the night or evening and during the day. This is in the, in the Princeton campus. And by the way, of Princeton campus, Mahadev Raman, whom I mentioned earlier, he teaches at, uh, as a visiting professor at, uh, at Princeton. Um, look, there are, it, it is and it isn't. And I like this, you know, if you look at this image, you, you can't quite figure out how the building is. It has a, uh, an ambiguous, uh, uh, you know, manifestation towards the outside, at least, towards this side and uh, this time of the day or evening. And during the days here, and this is very difficult to do, you know, to problematize the certitudes of a building through creating uh, ambiguity in a very different way from uh, Robert Venturi. I don't even know why I mentioned him here. I actually, I'm a great adversary of what he meant by learning from Las Vegas. I actually think there is nothing to, to learn from Las Vegas, but uh, Robert Venturi thought otherwise, although he probably had good intentions. I like Stephen Hall in this building very much.
Now, Hunter Point Library, I mentioned it in Queens, New York. I understood he had some problems because the people with disabilities didn't have uh, means to arrive at uh, some floors in his building and he was sued and so on. I hope he, he solved the problem and rectified that. This is the building, a uh, library in Queens. It's a more recent uh, building. I mean, it was built, uh, I don't know, finalized two years ago or three years ago. Anyway, uh, it's not in Manhattan, it's in Queens. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's close to, to, to Manhattan. Uh, you see Manhattan from here. In fact, you see here the work of, uh, well, not just Wallace Harrison, the, the, the United Nations uh, uh, building, uh, and we see, uh, you know, the, the Empire State Building, and here we see the Panam Building, now, now the Med Building by Walter Gropius, and so on. Uh, but this is, this is the library by, uh, by Stephen Hall. I'm not so sure why he created this entrance into the, this building that seems to be a little bit uh, prosaic for my taste, but um, in essence he, and that's why I think he had troubles, because there are no ways for someone in a wheelchair to arrive here. But I'm sure they found ways to, to correct this. It's a unifying space with these aisles, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the books, with the shelves for the books. And yes, the capriciousness of the openings into the world. And those who, you know, want a rational appraisal or description or justification for these uh, openings should uh, contemplate uh, the history of art and architecture where so many decisions were made in the name of something which was not exclusively rational or logistic uh, or logical it's the playfulness it's form yes but architecture is also form is is not just function it's also form and they come together and actually there is a book written uh, called the function of form there is a function that form has we cannot live without form we cannot live just with function you have to have form too and that's why uh, the, the peacock has its beautiful tail. Is it difficult to understand this? Uh, anyway, so this is the library by Stephen Hall in Queens, New York. And you see, it's quite, uh, it's filled with people. Certainly many, many more people than there are in the library at the University of Architecture here. And you see the internal space is rather, you know, it was, you know, moderately complex, almost visceral, because it's the stomach of the library, if I am to use uh, maybe an uh, alarmingly prosaic word. But this space, the interior, the sto I call it the, the womb, should I call it? No, the stomach of the building is the place of interaction, is where people interact. Too bad that, yes, uh, the people in the wheelchair uh, didn't uh, find the correct uh, ways of, uh, you know, arriving at all the floors properly, but I, I imagine the solution was found uh, since the troubles uh, were manifested. From the outside, besides the so-called uh, capriciousness or the capricious large windows, I mean, capricious formally speaking, you didn't expect this uh, unexpected uh, interior space because the outside is, uh, but actually if you contemplate more carefully, there is a connection between what these sections show and those uh, the, the, the aforementioned uh, large uh, openings uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the in the, in, the, in the box of the library, if I am to call it a box. Collaborations. Uh, yeah, let's talk also a little bit about this. He collaborated with a very interesting artist. They were friends and they, they created um, the facade uh, of uh, 
this art gallery storefront for art and architecture in New York City many years ago. In the meantime, Vito Acconci died, but he, he, he was a famous artist who also became an architect by his will, and he built a very interesting building in Austria, in Graz, but he built a few other things. But let's look at this unusual uh, enclosure of this uh, important uh, art uh, gallery in New York. This is what they did. And it's again about interaction. Uh, what you see here inside bursting almost uh, out of the building is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, an installation by Mark Forn, a master of um, parametric uh, design, scripting and programming, one that uh, Patrick Schumacher called, uh, you know, the bright star of the future. But the, 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 the facade of this building with these uh, unconventional openings into, the, in, 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 into its uh, enclosure was done by Stephen Hall and Vito Acconci, or maybe we should say Vito Acconci and Stephen Hall. Um, yeah. I'm a little bit nostalgic because I had uh, works here shown too. And uh, before they moved to this new location, uh, I even had a one-man show in, in, uh, on uh, Prince Street. It, it, the storefront had a small gallery and um, I was invited to have an exhibition there and I did. Um, and, but look, look at the interior. So, you know, this skin of the building actually shows the dynamics between, uh, you know, the inside and the outside, between art and the street, between the art community and the, you know, social life of the city. Sometimes this is opaquely closed, you know, it's, 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 it becomes uh, misanthropically, uh, uh, you know, inwardly oriented other times. Plus there is the, 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 the variation, you, depending on how you create these openings by moving these things, they all move, you uh, provoke the street to a reaction. So this is kind of a more aggressive porosity, if I am to call it so. You see here, it's totally uh, you know, shut off, it's a fortress. But these things can move and they do move. And, um, Bravo to them. I think they do the, did a good job. Stephen Hall and Vito Acconci, New York City. And here is, uh, you know, the uh, hinge space uh, of, uh, of, uh, that, that Stephen Hall thought of. I see he even sort of uh, doing something here in the, in the pavement, but this, I don't think this was done. Anyway, you understand the so-called concept. These people experiment and it shows, it shows. They push the frontiers of art and architecture. And I think we should inspire ourselves from them and, 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 and attempt to be uh, experimental too, and to try new ideas, try new things. I'm very familiar with Storefront because I was involved with it from the very beginning. And I know how much you know, the, uh, the founder of this uh, gallery struggled at first, you know, sacrificing himself when he started, he had to work in an office to pay the rent for a very small space. And uh, he was living in a, in a practically in a, in a closet, you know, in a very tiny little place. It was not even a room. He was making sacrifices for art, for experiment, for, uh, for uh, the, the beautiful adventure that culture is and should be. Stephen Hall and Jessica Langs, uh, we are approaching the end of the presentation. Tesser, Tesser, Tesseracts of Time explores the relationship between architecture and dance. Are we doing something similar? Not really, but I think we should. And it's a beautiful meeting between an architect and the choreographer or a dancer. The relationship between architecture and dance. 
and look at the dancers within the broken uh, of the x of of in of a, of, a, of, a, of a installation or how to call it a building uh, or a structure that Stephen Hall built. It's the dialogue between two arts. Yes, I have the audacity to call architecture an art. And it is at its best, it is an art and it, and it should be. Here they are. Stephen Hall on the left with his uh, rather provocative uh, pair of shoes and the dancers uh, and the dancer on the right. And what can we say? We need the artists, we need the dancer, we need the architect. We need them badly, but as artists, both as sensitive human beings who love culture, who love creativity, who love to, to even provoke sometimes, Free people, we need their freedom. They fight for us too, for our freedom, and we should do the same. Geometry and dance. Friedrich Nietzsche said, I would only believe in a dancing God. Beautifully said, too bad that the the Orthodox Church doesn't believe in a dancing God. They took away joy, even of spirituality, of faith. Faith should be joyous too, no? And you cannot be joyous in the absence of creativity. You can't. Now look here, you have Stephen Hall and you have Jessica with her dancing imagination and uh, you know, you are mesmerized. Now the Stephen Hall Foundation in Rheinbeck, which I mentioned, and you'll see a few of the structures he built by himself. I mean, not by himself, with, with his own money for this arts and cult for this cultural foundation in Rheinbeck, New York. Here they are. In fact, this is Stephen Hall here. And, you know, he brought people together on this uh, grass. And uh, he built this building and someone is reading something here. You see, art is really about bringing pe people together. It's about synthesis. It is about conjunction. It's not about analysis. It's about synthesis. It's about uniting, you know? And he finds time to even do this. And isn't it beautiful? I mean, this man who builds all over the world and I didn't show half of his oeuvre, uh, still finds time to invite poets and artists and you know to share uh, their works with other people bravo to him and here he is like a child i love this picture here is uh, neil denari here is uh, the pritzker prize laureate and winner tom main and here is the wife of, uh, of, uh, of stephen hall and do you see him he's like a child you know, playing with this model at 70, maybe 70 something. Uh, Tom Main, one of the founders of SciArc in Los Angeles and a good friend of uh, Stephen Hall, uh, Neil Denari, uh, who ran, who was the director of SciArc uh, for a good number of years, an important architect himself. It moves me, this picture. They are in Rheinbeck. And, and you know, they, they are like kids. They, 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 they experiment, they try new things. There is tension, there is an adventure. And this is an over 70 years old man. He's not retired, <laughs> quite the opposite. And here he is with his young wife and with their beautiful daughter. Of course, the daughter, you know, is making steps in the same direction, watercolors and creativity. In fact, uh, last year, when he had to leave the Zoom uh, meeting, uh, paying homage to Levi Suits, he excused himself because he had to prepare food for, uh, for his daughter. Um, anyway, and here he is in a little cubicle that he built for himself where he sometimes he, he said that he sleeps on the floor 
if he spends the early afternoon or even the night here, he's doing watercolors. He's thinking of his buildings here with a facing the lake. And there is no water here. There is no heating. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, you know, cubicle, uh, but uh, the, word, the light comes from the top as well. And uh, he views also the lake. So I think he has the perfect conditions to be very creative. And these are other buildings on the same campus, uh, you know, a, a foundation, the T Foundation in, uh, in, in Rhinebeck, uh, New York. He projected them, he designed them, and he built them. A stage there for who knows, uh, of course, he didn't cut down the tree, although it is in front of the stage. Uh, it's almost uh, ostentatious, his, uh, his generosity towards keeping that tree alive. And it should be kept alive, even in front of a human stage. And this is the building we saw, the X of E. Uh, ex Avin House in Rhinebeck, New York, uh, Stephen Hall. And I think that's it. So let's wish him happy birthday. This was not a, uh, it was a presentation that uh, uh, had a little uh, a moment of um, agitation from me because of those technical problems, but we still did it. And again, happy birthday, Stephen Hall.